Yeah. Now we are, I think. Now we are. Okay, Rocio, you want to Hi. start? I am, yeah. Hi, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for the for this third round table on STEM education and innovation. Um, we're very excited to have all these wonderful experts today from uh, from Germany. And I would like also to, to thank the, the people that are here with us, the audience. Uh, I'm sure that it's going to be a fantastic debate. And let's hope that after this roundtable, we will all be excited, enabled, and ignited by STEM for our schools, for all the schools. And then I'll let you, I'll give you the floor, all of you. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you very much, Rocio, for, for the kind introduction. And, and yeah, thanks for um, all of the people out there on, on uh, the different platforms joining us today. We are very excited to be here and we're very excited to have you. And we hope that this is um, yeah, going to be an interesting one hour and a half discussion. And we hope that we can yeah, spark some, some interests and yeah. Uh, have a lively discussion at the end of this roundtable discussion. And I'm very happy to have such a fantastic panelist today, which I'm going to introduce to you in a second. But let me first um, yeah, share my view on, on why we are doing this. Um, I think the, the 21st century um, yeah, holds massive challenges for us. We, we, yeah, I don't have to repeat this. You, you all know this. We, we have to decarbonize our whole economy. That's going to be a huge effort. We have to deal with, with uh, the, the consequences of climate change that will be like rising flea, sea levels and droughts and wildfires and thunderstorms. We have seen so many. And for, for these big challenges, we need good solutions and we need creative uh, technological solutions. And um, yeah, studies in STEM, so science, technology, engineering, and maths. Um, yeah, that's that's where where the solutions can be. Yeah, lay the foundation, um, and unluckily, there's not so many people choosing this these um, these um, subjects. And why this is the case? Um, well, we we're, we're trying to find out, and we're trying to find a way um, of of how to to improve the, the status quo and how what, what could be improved uh, to make this um, different. And yeah, with me here at TU Hamburg, so in, we were in the north of Germany, we, we have a sunny weather outside, you wouldn't believe, but, but that's, that's the case. And, and also um, some panelists are in other parts of Germany, I will introduce to them in one second. Yeah, we're here to discuss how we can enable, excite and ignite students for a STEM career, for really making them able, giving them the tools to, to change the world for better. Um, and yeah, with us today, today is uh, Julia Freudenberg. So Julia Freudenberg is uh, CEO and, and founder of the Hacker School in Hamburg. And she will, I'm, I'm, I'm sure she will tell us more about the Hacker School in a second, but thank you very much for being here. Uh, we have Sebastian Stacks, who is um, the developer of the app Feedbox. And that's uh, basically, it's an app that turns your mobile phone into a physical lab. And it's super exciting. I, I, I have it on my own phone. I play with it around all the time. But yeah, Sebastian Stacks, they won a whole lot of prizes. Um, and, and this is like a very good example for an app that can disrupt um, STEM education. And I'm very happy to have him here as well, share his thoughts on, on how to program apps and, and yeah, what you have to think of. Then we have Gesine Liese, who is the head of Kinderforscher in Nachwuchs Campus. It is um, she, she was also the founder. So 15 years ago, they founded this initiative that promotes STEM education and, and amongst uh, kids in schools. And, and they have a fantastic initiative. It's super popular and, and, and very well received and where, where they yeah, engineer didactic material boxes they, they give out to schools and then they can uh, make experiments so to help teachers um, making STEM education more fun and this is, I'm very happy to have you here as well then the next 
speaker I would like to introduce is Olaf Zeiske. Olaf Zeiske is a biology um, teacher at, at, um, at a high school here in Hamburg. And he's particularly um, into innovating um, everyday school teaching. And, and he has been a, um, collaborating with our university for quite some time in trying to make education at school more, um, yeah, cutting edge and, and more interesting. And, and yeah, he's, he's kind of the link to the school, to, the, to our um, recipients. So the, the ones that we want to reach with that. So it's very I'm very happy to have you here with us as well. And last but not least, Andrea Brose. She's the director for teaching and in the center of teaching and learning here at TU Hamburg. And she, um, yeah, this center for teaching and learning tries to improve and the way we teach here at, at university and how, how we can improve the methods that we, in teaching that we, that we do. And, and so she will give us a, a fresh view on, on modern didactics and, and, and how we, which role um, digital tools could play in, 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 in this role. Okay, as you see, this is a quite diverse um, panel. And yeah, I would like to probably start out with, um, with, the, with, the, with the start. So uh, at the beginning, uh, we have kids, right? And, and we wanna, uh, we, we try to make them, uh, make scientists or STEM people out of them. And, and when, when does this happen? When, when do people um, choose to become engineers, mathematicians, um, scientists. When, um, probably this, this goes to Olaf um, Zeiske, you, ha you, you have school kids, and when, when do you say, when do they decide what, what their major will be, what they will study? Shall I start or? Yeah, yeah please. Okay, uh, okay, yes. Um, well, high school is quite late. I mean, the, the older students we have, they, um, we can reach them. We can reach the interest and we know that we can steer it. Um, it has to do with um, a special structure. We use uh, at, at the upper secondary school, we form a kind of profiles, we call them, that are clusters of different subjects. And the students, they can select this. So it's a kind of streaming effect on, on the one hand, but um, so if, if, we, if we cluster biology and physiology and uh, arts, for instance, um, we catch those who are interested in biology. And um, by this, we can, we can trigger them, even they are 18 years old and uh, many of them, um, they change to the technical university after. Um, their graduation. So um, we have this, this huge benefit that we uh, are simply door to door to your university. And uh, so cooperation is quite easy. And for our students, um, it's real life to have a university <laughs> just uh, beside the school. And, um, but I think it's more worth to think about uh, younger students um, in the lower secondary school. Um, it's important to, to, yeah, to trigger the interest uh, to STEM subjects and, and even in the primary school. I think um, and Gesine, she, she will uh, tell us more about this. I think it's uh, their philosophy to start quite early with, with very, very young kids. Um, to, to awake the interest in, in, in nature and all this kind of things. Um, we, had, we had a real problem um, a couple of years ago, uh, chemistry and physics. Um, the, the two subjects they were not uh, elected um, by, by our um, older students. And so we, we, we simply, we were not able to fill the courses because they, they all switched to biology, for instance. Uh, so we, we had to react and we did it in a very successful way. Um, and that had to do with, with uh, the teachers. Uh, I think the teachers they play an incredibly important role uh, in this setting. Um, if you have teachers who burn, who really <laughs> are enthusiastic and make a lot of experiments, and they, they can trigger the, the, the kids when they are 
are 12, 15 years old, and they did in physics and in chemistry, chemistry. And this year, it's the first time uh, after many, many years that we uh, have a lot of chemistry courses in our uh, high school uh, and the upper secondary school. And um, it shows that that we can do it. So we, we really we have this um, power to um, to steer it. Yes. OK. Um, yeah, thanks. That's that's um, so you say it's important to have teachers that burn for the subject. It's, it's important to have experiments um, and it's important to start early. And probably this is uh, exactly the, the point where I'd like to uh, um, head over to to Gesine and Lise. And um, you're exactly doing this, right? You're trying to give younger students so in, in the elementary schools and, and, and following um, the opportunity to experiment. Could you elaborate a little bit on, on what Kinderforscher uh, does or what, what you do? Yeah, so um, we started 15 years ago and started in elementary school because in Germany there's a very good initiative called Haus der Kleinen Forscher, the House of the Little Researchers, which was already very active in assisting uh, kindergartens and preschools um, just to offer a scientific educational uh, topics. And so that was really well done. And then secondary school was teaching science, but in Germany or especially in Hamburg, there was nothing in between. And, um, and the primary school teachers were not educated um, to be science teachers because there's not really science class in primary school. So I saw this big gap um, myself. I grew up in the United States. That's why my um, English is very American. And um, I, I just saw this very big hole where Germany is losing or Hamburg is losing a lot of kids. And um, I decided I, I cannot change that by myself. Um, I could only teach a limited amount of, of pupils every year. Um, so I just realized that I have to I have to teach the grammar school teachers how they could be teaching science to themselves and simultaneously to the children. They can learn together. And so that's why we developed and offer um, ever since then group size experiment boxes and teaching material for anyone wanting to offer STEM, um, no matter what their background is, uh, to children starting at age about eight when they can start to read um, all the way up through high school to 18 year olds. And this material is specifically made so that any type of school teacher, anyone offering an after school program, you know, if you want to offer something in the free time of, of, of children or youngsters, camp counselors can offer STEM with our boxes. Also university personnel and company employees. So anyone um, who is willing, who is capable of working with the age group they want to work with by us is enabled to be able to offer some STEM. So we usually by now have approximately 1,200 pupils uh, per year, about 50 teachers um, and about 15 companies in several month courses here in the metropolitan region around Hamburg and um, offering these uh, classes during school, after school, or in camps. And uh, we really encounter um, the way we try to um, enable these people is all of our boxes start with an everyday question. Um, like, I like to eat pizza. How do you make pizza dough? A lot of people try to cook their own pizza. So how can you develop that dough? You know, if you want to have a thin, crispy dough, or if you want to have a thick, fluffy dough, how can you do that? Now, this is something that's going to be it, that interests teachers as well. I mean, teachers are humans; they like to eat pizza, and so if I can take a topic like that and and I have a box, you know, what makes yeast dough rise? Um, then teachers say, "Oh, I want to learn this myself. I'm going to take it to my kids, and I'm going to be learning this with the kids." And uh, so we also still have other topics. For example, how can we examine the soil? A lot of us have potted plants, or we have gardens. Uh, what type of soil do you have to put in your potted plant? How often do you then have to water it? Uh, what is soil? Uh, what does it consist of? Yeah. Or why, when I eat ketchup? Uh, why at first I turn my glass bottle around and no ketchup comes out, I pound on it and I have a whole plate of, full of ketchup. So all of these everyday observations that anyone makes, that's where we pick people up. Um, that's how we excite, yeah? 
Um, and then we have to empower. So while, while then with these boxes, you're excited about wanting to learn this, um, while doing the experiments, we have a didactic material to go with it um, so that the teachers and students are learning um, why. So there we're empowering them. And since we use a lot of everyday materials, things that you can find in any household or any in school, that's how we try to ignite. Because if we teach teachers and students how to work with everyday material, you don't need to be rich. You don't need to live in a rich country. I mean, we're talking to the world here. Um, you don't need to have expensive equipment. You can work with anything. You can learn how to do experimental series with yeast. Yeast is available anywhere in the world. I mean, we all eat bread. Um, and so that's how we can really um, change change a lot. And um, yeah, so we've built this up from third grade all the way through 12th grade. And then what we've also then included for the older students where we change the program name from Kinderforscher, which means child researcher, like our 15, 16 and 17 years, year olds don't wanna be children anymore. So that's why um, we, we change the program name for them starting at grade eight or nine to Nachux Campus. And there we then also include companies so that we bring together these everyday questions. We teach them via the experiment science and with the help of the companies, we teach them STEM professions. So if I like that yeast experiment, you know, maybe I want to come up and become a biology lab technician, or maybe I want to go and work in a, um, in a uh, mechanic shop making machines to, um, to change dough, to work through dough so a lot of people can be fed. Um, or maybe I want to study biotechnology. Um, and so there we also need companies, the university and companies, to show the kids what types of apprentices should I, could I do? How can I become a mechanic? But also how could I study mechanical engineering? And if I learn, if I do this apprenticeship or if I study this subject at college, what will my everyday work look like afterwards? And how can I improve the world and change the world by picking up a STEM career? And that's what we're specialized in. Okay, that's, that's... Very impressive. I'm, I'm not aware of, of such an initiative um, anywhere else in Germany or anywhere else in the world. I'm not sure. Is, is this really your idea or did you, did you come up with this uh, yourself? Is, is... Yeah, it, it has a lot to do with my upbringing. I lived in the United States. I'm a first generation German immigrant in the United States and I grew up there from when I was one year old till 18. And I was very in Silicon Valley, California during the years where when I moved to Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley was just agriculture. Um, and when I moved away, it was what you know Silicon Valley to be at. Um, Apple was founded, things were founded in your garage. And that's the whole thinking I grew up with. And I also grew up with the thinking that everyone can change the world. So I started Kinderforsche in my own kitchen. It was running in my house the first year. I start years. I started with a thousand five hundred euros of my own money, and then I decided either I can change the world with that or I can't. And yeah, then we won several prizes, which really, or I won several prizes, which really helped us um, build up what Kidnafosha is today. And then, of course, the support. And this is what you're going to be hearing from me over and over again working together with schools, with teachers, because if I by myself cannot change the world, but mm -hmm. I can support teachers, I can support trainers working with children, um, I can support people so that they can change the world using the teaching materials that we produce. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you also, um, Kinderforscher has, has now an impressive um, online repository of videos, right? Where, where you can also with the, materials can can we re, re, yeah do experiments we have, you know. we have youtube videos there's a youtube channel kinderforsch on the tuhh and then we have a hands-on experiment website called kniffelix yeah, yeah, k-n-i-f-f-e-l-i-x -I -F -F -E but if you go on our homepage kinderforsch.de then you will see kniffelix there and there for example if you want to learn how to make your own yeast dough how to how to um 
how to make an experimental series. Uh, go on Kinderforschern on Kniffelix, and there you can participate, and uh, you can see our, you can experience the STEM material from anywhere in the world. Okay, yeah. So you say it's very important to excite um, children. I mean, children are excited on their own. If I think of my kids, they are excited about everything. It's it's great, and 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 yeah, I think it's it's about uh, saving this excitement through the years of school and and keeping it keeping the curiosity right and until they yeah it's become... it's teaching them how can you think scientific so they're excited and they think it's really neat that the yeast dough rises but how can i examine what parameters are important why does yeast dough need to be kept warm well let's try it out what happened like what's warm you know how warm should it be so let's let our dough rise at a at a at a not so warm place, at a warmer place, at a really hot place. So is, is more heat gonna be better? Well, all of you know, once you bake yeast dough, the yeast is just doesn't work anymore, it's dead. Um, and of course you don't want your bread to rise in your cabinet, yeah? You don't wanna take your sandwich to work or to school in the mornings and have it be larger by the time lunchtime is around. Um, yeah, so it's all about like, how do I do this? And so what you really, the kids, kids are excited. So teach them how to think scientifically on the topics they're excited about. And that's how you can ignite them to be our scientists to our en engineers, because they'll be capable of changing the world and they want to change the world and then they'll do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. And also one, one very uh, important aspect you, you said, I, I think, is is uh, working together for students and for teachers. So you say the target group is not solely the, the students, but also the teacher, because they decide what's what's on the menu and uh, in their schools. Right. So this they're is the multipliers for the, the participants of the hackathon to, to keep in mind uh, if you if you yeah design an app for that's targeted at students keep in mind also that the teacher's perspective so that that they need to be willing to to give the students the possibility to use this app at school or uh, yeah to make this uh, um yeah available so i think this is a very important uh, point you were mentioning probably this yeah because the thing is if you reach one student you reach one student if you reach one teacher, a teacher works together with 120, 150, 180 students per day. So reaching a teacher, empowering a teacher makes it possible to just exponentially empower incredible amounts of people. Now, what's really great is not everyone has these fantastic teachers. Yeah? So what I really believe in, and that's what I do with Knifferdix at the same time, I believe in giving single interested people opportunity to participate in things, yeah, but empowering people. So that's the ideal thing. So when you're when you're making an app, when you're producing an app, and uh, that's what uh, Sebastian did. You know, he produced an app where he can reach a single person like you, Alex. You know, wanting to measure things. On the other hand, he reaches a teacher like Olaf who uses this instrument in class, and then he can reach 180 kids with that, or per year. Um, yes. Looking over the years, he reaches a lot more, so. That that what that happened uh, two weeks ago. I think, Alexander, you was the first person who told me about uh, Fifox, or Firefox, is it Firefox, Fifox? Uh, it's Fifox, but uh, we Fifox. do not really mind if people call it Firefox. Yeah. It's for physical phone experiments. <laughs> That's why it's Fifox, but okay. everybody says yeah. Firefox because it just looks like it. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, so I called it Firefox. And um, yes, and after, after I left Alex two weeks ago, I, um, I, I put it on my smartphone and um, was playing with uh, different um, factors there. And um, then I found this light sensor measuring um, tool. And um, we were just uh, we were just running a project in the in the wood nearby the school. And uh, we were looking to the, the moss layer and the herb layer and we were asking ourselves how much light does the vegetation down close to the ground really needs? Where is the light compensation point for the vegetation there? So uh, it was incredible because we had Firefox now and we were able to, to measure um, the, the light intensity. And um, 
So uh, also the, the students, they uh, immediately um, downloaded Firefox and, <laughs> and it was quite nice to see that uh, we, we had different smartphones there, but uh, the, the, sample, the samples were quite the same, the values uh, we sampled were quite, quite, quite similar. So it, it mm -hmm. did a really good job uh, to measure there. So imagine uh, 24, 25 students were running with <laughs> the Firefox and on the smartphones through the wood and were me measuring uh, light intensity. That was fantastic, yes. And that is yeah. what was what Gesine said that um, I was the multi multi uh, multiplicator, yeah, mm -hmm. multiplier, multiplier. Yeah, multiplier. I was a multiplier. Who, um, yeah, and Actually, now everybody even. Yeah. Uh, you can have even more multiplication if you reach those who teach the teachers. Mm -hmm. So if you go to teachers education, then of course you reach a bunch of teachers who then again reach the students. Um, but uh, that takes more time <laughs> to implement and uh, it's more long term perspective, of course. Yes, I, I was very surprised. I asked my physics uh, colleagues at the school and uh, all of them knew Firefox. <laughs> so <laughs> okay, <great. laughs> oh, really? it's already it's, it seems to be already uh, quite known. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we're Fantastic. very happy to, to have Sebastian with us, uh, even though he did just one of twice yesterday, yeah. right? I, I, uh, is it, a, um, it was announced yesterday, I saw that you were granted another million of, of uh, uh, euros in, in, in funding for continuing um, your work. Unfortunately not, uh, it was one million for uh, 10, uh, for 10 uh, different, uh, for 10 projects and uh, Firefox is one of them. Ah, um, so. And we did not actually get uh, exactly a tenth of it, but a little bit less. So uh, okay. it was not that much about the funding, but uh, this is uh, from the yeah, German Stifterverband, that's hard to explain outside of Germany. And they, um, it's more a reputation thing, I would say. It's, um, we were announced to be one of the top 10 innovative projects in Germany. So. Uh, I think it's not that much about the money because we have to share it with the other 10 projects, but uh, it was uh, quite an honor. Yeah. yeah it's, it's an honor for us to have you. Yeah, and we see it's, uh, it's uh, useful, right? I, um, I'm very happy, Olaf, that, that, uh, to hear about this story. I think, yeah. That's and, and real probably, life. <laughs> yeah, and probably, Sebastian, when, when you were uh, thinking about uh, implementing Fevox, you, you did not have in mind measuring the vegetation. Um, or the light intensity of vegetation needs, right? But but these things just evolve, and, and that's the nice thing about apps, right? They they are so scalable, and 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 probably, yeah. So IT is 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 probably something at the core of of this um, whole um, hackathon here, where, where we where we invite people to to think in this direction, right? What what else is there out? What can help us? Well, there's so much. There's so much possibilities now with technology. Um, how, how can we use this in, in a way that helps STEM? And, and yeah, we, we would love to yeah, ex inspire you here today a little bit and, and to help you yeah, decide for joining this hackathon uh, this weekend and then participate. And, and, and yeah, maybe you, you have an idea now or already had it and, and you want to implement it. And, and um, yeah, let, let's see what, what comes up. There's another topic I would like to um, touch, and 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 that's the gender um, balance in STEM. Last oh, in 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 total studies last year in Germany, we had 50% female students for the first time in, in German history. We had 50% of student um, beginners um, female and 50% male. This is very um, a very good notice. I think it was was rising. For years now, and now we're um, finally uh, balanced. But in STEM, it's not really the case. In STEM, we have one third uh, female students only. And I'm, I'm, I was wondering, why is this the case? Um, maybe uh, Julia Freudenberg, do you have an idea wh why this, that this could be the case? Why, why are um, girls not as attracted to STEM as boys? Well, actually, I'm, I just feel comfortable to talk about IT or about coding, which is just, well, in German, you would say the I and the mint, mint um, part. Yeah. Um, well, if you, if you see the way of, of bringing up kids here in Germany, you have a lot of hard stereotypes like boys do tech and girls do languages or whatever thing. And just um, repeating the stereotypes over and over again makes it even harder to crush it. And just 
you know, Germans are more about to complain about things instead of changing them directly. And just, you know, seeing the bright part of the story and just make them try. Just do not compare boys and girls, but just, well, well, let them try their hands on coding once and you can change the world as well. And like if you if you check for, for girls schools, well, we hardly have any in Hamburg. I guess there's no one actually, but we have about 60 in, in Bavaria. And if you have girl schools and have math classes, you wouldn't guess there are girls who are good at math and there are girls who are not good at math. Congratulations. And well, this is this is life. And if we can change the attitude toward things just by trying, we can change um, the run of the on uh, the run of this topic because this is why. And I guess this is a question we asked our founded girls hacker school. And hacker school normally we just tend to build bridges between companies and their corporate volunteering and the interest of kids in coding. Because I believe that we will never ever have enough teachers in school who teach IT. Because there is no, I don't say it, no real reason to go to school for someone who is who is good in coding. At least um, in in North Rhine-Westphalia, we have 25 percent of the 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 teachers, uh, or at least it's just 25 percent taken of the positions for IT teachers. And so this means we have to build bridges and inspire uh, kids um, through the engagement of companies. And once we founded the the, uh, the girls hacker school, we noticed that as well girls and their moms are they they just do the same. They just need a safe space. We teach exactly the same stuff. Sometimes a bit more um, CSR commitment in a sense like um, sustainability or whatever issues. But I guess if we if we want to have more girls in STEM, we just need to inspire them very early before they get the first period and notice they might that they, they have to be nerds to find this topic interesting. And and you at the hacker school you mentioned um, this girls hacker school. Could you briefly explain to us what the hacker school is and and what the girls hacker school is specifically? Well, hacker school as such is just the building bridges between co companies and kids. Like take two IT guys or girls um, who do this for a living and 10 kids and let them do cool stuff over the weekend or in the morning in schools. We just started to have hacker school at your school as a special pro program at, at hacker school. Hmm. And um, for us, the idea is that the volunteers we have They love what they do. They are in this job for a reason. And just if you see that adults are excited about what they do, it's so easy to, ins to inspire kids. Because if you love what you do, everyone else will love it too, who is working with you. And so this idea for the girls' second school just um, raised in my head when I heard a mom saying to her daughter like, oh dear, mommy wasn't good as in math as well, so don't worry. And I was so mad at that moment because this is so stupid. This doesn't have to help the girl at all, but just um, fixes the stereotypes again. And so we said, no, you both, you will come for coding. And we just do it, the girls among each other. And they had so much fun. And this is why we funded Girls Hacker School afterwards. So it's 11 till 99 years. Now in Hacker School is 11 till 18. But just to get the moms that they do not destroy more than they need to, we just let them code together and have a good weekend. All right. uh, very, very impressive. And you're you're also super successful, right? And during Corona, you you kind of switched your your portfolio towards online courses, or, or you added them, and and that's a really, um, yeah, seeing a lot of of attraction to to people, right? Is is, and 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 also you're very. Yeah, I saw you on, on different, um, in YouTube, you're, you're very popular and in different settings. So it, it's it really, um, yeah, is for the, in, in this side guys. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of, um, yeah, focus on IT right now and, and, and education. Your, your project kind of, um, yeah, marries these two, two things and, 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 yeah, really tries to change for better. I, I, I was really impressed uh, with, with how successful the, this project was. Well, um, Alex, popular and successful is a big one. I guess it depends always on the point of view. But yes, we are, we are getting a lot of attention in media. And there are people who guess that I do not have any other items of clothing except this wonderful hacker school shirt, <laughs> which is partly true. I have another pullover. Um, 
what, what we like to do is just um, change the question towards what does it take? And before Corona, we, we have been active in 40 cities throughout Germany. Uh, and then we had one week where I was about to close everything because I was not under the impression we can make it. But then once I got my mindset back, we swapped within five days to just online. And um, because I guess, well, we should probably be prepared that Corona is not the last virus we will have. And I guess if we allow a virus to, to decide whether our kids are going to be educated towards the future or not, then we are probably not in the driver's seat. And so just to check uh, what we can do and uh, what were the important points to, to take as well online, like having two IT guides or girls and 10 kids, having it for two days. So in the night in between, the, the brain of the kids can just sort everything and the brain is gorgeous. And so you train them at the first day to the level of five and the next day they start at a level of 10. And it's just amazing to see then the sparkling eyes afterwards. And so as for during Corona pandemic, we decided to go to schools. I was strongly against it for years, but I said, well, if you want to reach those socio disadvantaged kids, we have to go to school. It's the only way we, we can get them. And so just seeing that kids who study is going uh, to receive hard sphere or social aid, and they consider this at their vocational future as well. They just start coding and you see, no, it's not what they have to do necessarily. They can change their own way. And this is a lot of work. I am so tired after this year. I was guessing that last year was the worst ever, but I understood this year is even more challenging. But it's really cool to see that, that well, this is a footprint you can you can leave behind. And even it's the hacker school t-shirt, I'm willing to go to our federal president once more in exactly this t-shirt, if it gives us the, the, the advertising or the, the being well known we need. Yeah, this is, uh, yeah. Thanks for this uh, nice statement. So, yeah, and, and, and yeah, I would love to see then your reception at, at the president in your, in your t-shirt, but I'm glad you, you wear it also today. <laughs> Alex, I have been there at the International Women's Day on 8th March, and then we got to the target show, and we got about <laughs> nearly 50 calls. How can one dare to go in this t-shirt to Steinmeier? But to be honest, he doesn't know that I have other items of clothing, and so I didn't want to shock him. So it's all good, <laughs> and probably we can find a way, like going to school as well with students, to show the kids that as well young people, a pick STEM as a career might as well be a cool cooperation area. So just let's do it together. Yeah, oh, great. <laughs> let's, uh, let, let's do that, yeah. Um, one last point to this gender uh, thing. Do you think it, it's, it leads different ways to um, excite, enable and ignite boys versus girls? You, you mentioned stereotypes that uh, mom mentioning I was not good at maths too and, and stuff, but is do your uh, courses that you specifically uh, tailor to girls have different aspects than those that you don't tailor to girls specifically and and just one part mainly basically there's not a big difference um, or it's two two parts and um, what helps with girls are role models just to see that someone already took this path to wherever to like STEM, it helps a lot to imagine that you can do it yourself as a girl. And the second part is um, females, no matter what age, tend to need a reason why. See, I married a wonderful IT guy 20 years ago, and he, he is the love of my life and my inspiration for hacker school. But we have a certain difference, like him getting a new IT gadget, like, wow, cool, I play, I play me. What's it for? So do I have anything out of it? Could I use it for anything? No. So enjoy your gadget, but I'd be doing something else. And if we have this, especially social engagement, like uh, or sustainability or whatever helps, if we can add this content wise to the hackathon, whatever we do, it helps a lot for girls to find their reason why to, as Gesine said, change the world. And this helps a lot just from the level of, of difficulty or whatever, there's absolutely no difference, more the reason why, which really helps with girls. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, very interesting. Thank you. Um, I would like to probably switch gears now and, and look a little bit at, at life in university. 
So once we have people that come to our technical universities and study STEM, um, we see a lot of them also quitting their studies after a while. So this is this is a phenomenon that that has been pretty consistent over the years. And we have about 50% of, of students that stop studying uh, STEM after one semester or one year. And this is a lot. And uh, Andrea Brose, um, do you do you know why do so many students quit their STEM studies? Yeah, I guess I should say I know not by having really found out myself, but indeed there is research done on that. And um, in fact, one um, uh, research was very actually fruitful that was done at our university, but also included other universities in which they actually did try to find out why do they stop and they they roughly broke it down into uh, five actually categories um, of people why did they leave it's very difficult to get these people because they just leave and they they don't give call us back so to speak right they're not required to tell us why they leave so it was a long study for many many years and so roughly speaking um there's one type uh, of, of students that are coming to the university you know we all assume let's say 90, 95% are actually really excited and they chose something they want to study. So for them, it's probably also a disappointment to stop. So why did they quit studies? So one of the um, um, types that they observed is the type that is technologically centered. So they're very, you know, they, they do like to play whether boy or girl, whether they see a reason or not for it. But then they're just simply overwhelmed by the amount of material that they're encountering, by the level of abstraction. So put short a little bit, perhaps the academics overwhelmed them. Um, for whatever reason, that's not asked for now. Um, but that makes them frustrated and, and not being able to keep up. They lose their study groups and they're out of the system very, very soon. And that's actually the largest group. That was about a third of those that were interviewed um, that uh, where we were categorized uh, for being technologically centered yet academically possibly not strong enough. And then we have kind of exactly the counterpoint. point. Those students that are academically very strong, in fact, they even pass the exams, even the exams where mechanics won in our school sometimes, yeah, 60 to 80 percent and then a first try don't pass. So they may even pass it, they even get a good grade. Um, yet, why do they quit studies? This was actually the second largest group of about a quarter of the students and they just didn't find any relevance in the courses they had to take in the beginning. They didn't find it professionally relevant for them because they had an idea, I want to become a chemical engineer or a civil engineer, but instead they had to take courses that didn't seem to relate what they have chosen as a field of study. Um, and then also the contents were disconnected. This is actually a point we are working now on an, a QHH uh, already successfully in one field and another field to make these subjects that are needed in STEM education in the beginning also more connected and more professionally relevant. And then there are a couple other uh, uh, smaller groups uh, where they finish studies. It, it, it ranges from students having just a very difficult time with the construct university. They often come from backgrounds where they're the first um, academically um, uh, thriving uh, people in their family. And they just have a very difficult yeah, time with the construct of university, the independence you need to bring uh, and deal with. Uh, they're the smaller groups, uh, nevertheless, they could possibly be uh, still kept some of them that uh, uh, need just more support in how to find study groups and how to work in a group and etc. Now that said, it also shows it's there's not a one quick fix time solution because it's different people need to be addressed differently and that calls ever more so for more flexible learning paths in, in particular in the beginning of the studies, which is what many universities try to offer by now, uh, for example, through some kind of year zero of studies uh, where people actually get an orientation. Is this the right place for me? Do I perhaps need more of that element or that element? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you say there's multiple reasons why, why students quit after, after a semester or, or, or two. They are either overwhelmed uh, by, by the academic or yeah, by the level of abstraction that's, that's required or by, by math or mechanics or whatever these, or they, are, they don't find it relevant. Um, so yeah, so modern didactics is, is kind of working on these things, no? Uh, trying to make, yeah, you said you, you're trying to connect uh, studies. So make, make people, um, yeah, tell people that mechanics or maths is important for this and that and, and have probably uh, questions and problems in math that are related to the subjects. And, but 
Um, what, what, what else is, is there kind of, what's the hot topics in didactics right now? So where, where, where is the field moving? What are the innovations that, that are being explored here? <laughs> Yeah, yeah that's, that's a good question because it also picks up on many of the uh, topics that uh, uh, any of the previous speakers said, uh, anywhere from motivation, relevance, asking the why question, um, being really motivated. Uh, so one of the big trends, in fact, and in Europe in particular, due to a very big call, the European U uh, uh, Union called out, is the concept of challenge-based learning. I kind of don't like these, you know, words that are thrown around uh, and, you know, everybody comes up with new didactics, but the newest one is challenge-based. New Next kid on the corner, challenge-based learning. So what is challenge-based learning? Well, kind of sadly, there's no common understanding of what challenge-based learning really is. It is uh, implemented and used in, in various facets, but it does have some basic uh, ideas, basic structures. It is it is uh, promoted, in fact, as a means of uh, trying to align better because that alignment is not really happening yet. The, uh, on the one hand, the acquisition of, of disciplinary knowledge and that with the development of, of transversal competencies uh, and both of which are needed in the work world, but shall be and should be developed also as part of the learning process simply because it helps to learn. Um, and it addresses also the issue of motivation because here you actually do put the learner much more in the driver's seat than in traditional education, by which I mean, you let to some degree the student choose what exactly kind of smaller problem they want to work on, given that there's some big topic they need to develop. And so that drives the motivation up, of course, because they, I want to actually find out that, you know, it's kind of uh, like uh, Gesine said with the Kinderforscher, they're just excited because they know, yeah, my ketchup doesn't come out of the bottle. Um, and so just picking up that motivation, that still works. And Oliver said it also, uh, sorry, Olaf, uh, Oliver or Olaf, um, okay. Olaf, <laughs> um, you know, in high school, igniting, the, you know, sparking the interest in the students, that's really relevant. And so um, what it also has in common is uh, coming back to what you said in the beginning, uh, Alex, namely uh, that we do need to face the challenges of the world today. So what typically what is common in all of the challenge based learning um, um, implementations is the authentic authenticity of the problem. The, that it's socio-technological typically and societal problems. They are often tied to the sustainable development goals of the European um, uh, not European, sorry, United Nations. Um, and so they are really things that people are wondering about. And of course, climate change is one of them, right? How do I make a climate neutral campus, for example, uh, that you could really ignite people there? Okay, yeah, very interesting. Thank you. And, and what you, would you say, which role could digital tools play in, in, in making STEM education more exciting? So we, we heard about uh, FIFOX and we will hear about it in, in a second. Um, and we heard about um, the hacker schools or the, the, the competency in, in, in coding. Um, what would you say, which, what role could, could um, such digital tools play in, in, in making STEM more exciting? Yeah, yeah, that's a, exactly more exciting. Um, so I think I see two major aspects. It's actually three in total, but two major aspects. I mean, first of all, when we implement any kind of digital tool, whether it be an app or anything else, we better make sure that we are not worsening the quality of education, meaning that the learning outcome ends up decreasing. So that's the bare minimum. I think we can all easily agree on that. But of course, ideally, you utilize uh, technology in order to make the education even better. And there are many, many formats uh, developing. Actually, it dates back to even tens of years ago already. I have also the background from the United States where I was first encountering technological aspects in education beyond uh, PowerPoint slides, so to speak. <laughs> um, uh, but secondly, we also owe the generation or, you know, the, 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 uh, the learners uh, to be exposed to the technology. May it be the technology that immediately enhances the learning process or simply the technology that is actually also the one that they end up using later in the workforce. And so ne having never been exposed to that um, really um, is, is, puts these uh, uh, graduates at a disadvantage when it comes to having them in the workplace. Uh, uh, so mm -hmm. anywhere from igniting them, exciting them, putting the relevance in connection with the app, actually picking up many of much of our generation, I would say, in that they have their hand in their hand, you know, so when they are in the elevator, they take the Firefox and say, hey, how high is actually my building? I'm living on the fourth floor. I have no idea how high my building is. And you can measure it. Um, and that way, 
again, we, we really uh, excite students uh, to actually pick up on these topics and trying to understand them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you say digital tools are important, but they shouldn't be misused. They shouldn't, they shouldn't replace good uh, teaching. Uh, they, they, so just showing them a YouTube video doesn't make for yeah. good teaching. So yeah. that's also an important thing. So that also, um, yeah, to keep in mind, you, yeah, when when probably in the hackathon that that a digital tool probably can help, but it's not going to replace good teaching. Um, but yeah, probably, I, I'm not sure. This is uh, open to debate and, and maybe we can discuss this with, 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 the, with the audience afterwards. Um, yeah, thank you, Andrea, for this. Um, now I'd like to come to uh, the fee folks. We were talking about this uh, quite a bit already, but, but now I would like to, to hear from, from you, uh, Sebastian, maybe you could uh, share with you. So I, I can uh, briefly introduce, um, FIFOX turns your, your, your smartphone into, into a physics lab and, and you won numerous uh, prizes, including, um, yeah, I just read here a little bit, the Ars Legendi Faculty Award 2020, the Stift of a Band in the German Physical Society, and the Wilhelm Westphal Teaching Award, um, and the Archimedes Award, Verband zur Förderung des Mints, which is promoting STEM teaching. So, um, yeah, it's a very uh, successful app that's that's uh, being downloaded a couple of million times already, if I'm correct. Um, yeah. Could you please tell us what what you can do with this app? In, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, how much time do you have? <laughs> no, but. Um, so the because there's by now there are so many functions um, to this app, but the basic idea is that we use the uh, sensors in the smartphone um, as a mobile lab. Um, so the idea is um, that um, yeah, each of our smartphones uh, has um, a whole list of sensors, like an accelerometer is in every single smartphone. Um, there's a gyroscope in most smartphones, as a magnetometer, as a compass, um, also present in most phones. Um, of course, microphones and everyone. Um, the light sensor, by the way, um, is in also in most phones, but it's not accessible on iPhones simply because there's no interface to read it. But they have it to control the brightness of the display. But um, it's so, yeah, it also depends on your phone which sensors are available. Um, yeah, and Firefox gives access to the, those sensors. And um, it's, um, so I hope this works because I didn't try it before, but yeah, it works great. Okay, so I've got uh, the <laughs> live image from, from my phone here. Uh, so this is what PFOX looks like. Uh, and you see this uh, list of uh, sensors here in the, um, so you can simply open the accelerometer and read the data, plot something. So I'm shaking it a little bit and uh, zoom in and uh, check out the values, make some measurements. So that's all nice. But um, what FIFOX also does is it offers some configurations so that you can start with the experimentation right away without um, dealing with all the technical details. So for example, just heard about the elevator experiment. So we've got an entry elevator and FIFOX uses then the barometer on your phone. Unfortunately, that's one of the more rare sensors, it's about half the phones, I would say, um, to measure the change in altitude. So yeah, how much, how high did you travel in the elevator? So of course, nothing's happening here except for noise while I'm sitting here uh, at the velocity of the ele uh, elevator and also acceleration. Um, and so students can just pick this entry and start measuring while more advanced users can um, co create their own configuration. So if you ever used FIFOX, you notice a bunch of stuff in here that you don't have in your app. Um, so other users can simply create their own configuration and share it with the QR code. And with this, we also have got very extensive interfaces. So we have a network interface. Um, so multiple users can uh, share their measurements into one big measurement, uh, we've got a Bluetooth interface with which we, for example, created um, CO2 monitors uh, with, with a few German schools as a pilot project. So um, they then look like this. So we created a PCB, some electronics, and the, actually the students, young students down to uh, sixth grade, um, built their CO2 monitors actually because of the pandemic. So they can um, have a guide on when to exchange the air in the room. But the great idea is that 
After the pandemic, this one can connect to PFOX via Bluetooth um, with a simple Arduino um, library that we offer. Um, and then they can plot the CO2 um, measurement in PFOX and make more experiments uh, that, are, that um, are relevant to STEM classes. Like in biology, they can do stuff about uh, photosynthesis, or it's even hard to pronounce it in German, right? So um, yeah, but you, you, you get the idea. Uh, there are some chemical experiments we can do with these external sensors. And so beyond this basic idea that uh, every student already has a little lab in, in uh, his or her pocket, to explore the world. Um, we also extend on that so that you can easily connect it to um, cheap and simple projects like using Arduino. And um, so that's a very quick overview of all the things that we can do. But I think the basic idea is everyone can just start without any upfront cost because they have a smartphone, they install the app, and they've got some sensors to start with. And it's even... Uh... You, you work without uh, advert advertisements, right? It's it's uh, free of advertisements, so you don't you don't collect yes, it's... data from from people and and you don't track. So it's really based on on. Um, I think you. How is it funded? So is, this is. <laughs> <I get. laughs> That's a difficult question, yeah. But uh, so I think the easy answer is we are a university, we are the good guys. And yes, you're right, there's, there's no advertisement. We uh, do not charge anyone for this. Um, uh, we do not collect any data. It's actually open source, so everyone can um, participate. Uh, although um, a little problem with the source code is that uh, it did not start out as uh, with, with a plan to become such a huge project. So especially older parts are not structured that easily that everyone can uh, quickly look at it and understand how this works. So if anybody wants to rework it, it's open source, so you can <laughs> help us there. Um, but um, yeah, the funding is, um, so the base funding is mostly just my position at the university. Uh, I'm from a solid state physics department, actually, but of course, FIFOX is not that much about solid state physics. Um, and uh, the head of our department, um, Professor Stampfer, uh, actually came up with the idea to create this app, or actually his brother came up with the idea who's doing didactics in Innsbruck, but that's way too much background. Um, but um, the, so he came up with this idea to create an app like this simply for all students in one lecture. And I happened to have some experience with Android development at that point and uh, wanted to impress the boss. <laughs> so I created a little app that you can dangle from a string and then it tells you how long the string is because of the movement. And then the idea was born to create this app just for all students. And it became bigger and bigger and bigger. At some point, we released it. And then it went to the roof. And now it's my main job. And I would say I'm in physics didactics now instead of solid state physics. But still, my position is funded by the solid state department because uh, the head of our department is also really excited about this app and loves this app. And um, so um, it's, at this point, it's mostly his decision. But the problem is... Um, um, being funded like this doesn't scale very, very well because uh, we have got more than 2 million installations by now, actually, um, uh, which doesn't all mean active users. Uh, this, of course, also counts people who install it once and then uh, do not use it again. But uh, as the numbers go up, uh, you need more personnel just to deal with the amount of support requests um, because we really want to help the people who struggle with some technical problems. Uh, we also need this to, to learn which things to fix um, in, in the app. Um, and so by now, our team has grown a little bit. Some, some in our team are simply students who are working on their master thesis or their PhD. Um, there uh, are actually two professors, the head of our department and, uh, uh, and uh, Professor um, uh, Heidrun Heinke, who is uh, about physics didactics. Um, but we still need someone who does um, teacher trainings and workshops and does the communication. And this is mostly funded through research projects or um, actually this guy that I just mentioned is uh, funded by uh, the Hans Hermann Voss Foundation. So it's funded by a foundation. Um, but uh, it's an ongoing question because uh, on one hand, you've got those who say you've got too many installations, there has to be a way to uh, to get some financi uh, financiation back. On the other hand, uh, I'm the guy who says, wait, but we cannot charge for it because it should be motivating to use it to for education. So even a few cents is off-putting there. We cannot collect data. We cannot do all this stuff. And um, so I'm more striving to to uh, foundations and stuff like that. But yeah, it's, an, it's a bit of an ongoing struggle. Um, so the base fund, um, funding for FIFOX is safe. So anyone who's thinking about long-term usage, um, 
I will stay at the university and my position is safe, but um, everything beyond this is something that we uh, try to figure out uh, regularly. And yeah, so it's not such an easy question. <laughs> Sebastian, we should really do a think about a cooperation between Hacker School and your project just to have a really, really good approach to more schools or whatever usage. We should really... Yeah, I, th I thought so as well when, when I heard about this, because um, I think one of the easiest and fastest connection would be through our Arduino library, I would think, just from from the idea there. Yeah, yeah it's great. Great to hear that that uh, new connections and, and probably new new projects spark from, from this encounter today. And I hope that also, yeah, more ideas uh, can be sparked in our uh, our audience that hopefully a lot of you will participate in the hackathon this weekend where, where you're about to yeah to innovate and, and, and to create uh, design a, a digital tool that helps stem education uh, kind of what sebastian already did and, and julia in a, in a sense also doing and, and what gesine um with her project is doing and and, and yeah olaf is using is just cool so um Sebastian, I would like to ask you probably one final question. I think we were already um, well progressed in time, but um, I think it's valuable to our, our audience now. Um, so you, you did all, all of this, you implemented an app, so you know what it takes and, and what the complexity of each step is. So what you, would you say was the biggest challenge or what is the, are the biggest challenges when turning an idea into an app that then really works? <laughs> oh, that's that's um, I can answer this very specifically for FIFOX, uh, but it's hard to generalize because this, uh, of course, depends on, on each project. So for FIFOX, one problem was that um, it's at least at the time we created FIFOX, and I think it would still be true today, but I didn't research it again. Uh, it was impossible to implement FIFOX in a platform independent um, way. So there are frameworks to implement an app such that it works on Android and iOS. And uh, our goal uh, still today is to reach as many users as possible without having them to buy a new phone because the idea is we want to support the stuff that's already there, especially in developing countries where they are still using older phones. So that all this should work. Um, but FIFOX um, works best if we have got really low level access to the sensors. So we're not directly talking to the sensors. We have still, to, have still have to go through the APIs of the manufacturers. But if we look at some framework that does this platform independently, um, usually we lose some functionality. Uh, and the same is true for the way we um, create the graphs that show the data. Um, I mean, just the example of the accelerometer right now uh, that I showed, um, was uh, about 400 values per second, then on three axes, um, so for three graphs. Uh, so after 30 seconds, you've got about 10,000 data points. And the only way we can have this smooth zooming in is uh, to create these graphs with OpenGL. And so, uh, so with graphics acceleration. And back when we created this, there was no way to do this across multiple platforms. So we have to develop VFOX trials. We do, do everything for Android and everything for iOS again. Um, and that's, um, not motivating. So you've got a new thing on your to-do list, you start implementing it, and once you're done, you think, okay, that's great, and then, yeah, you turn over to the other system, and then ah, I have to, to have to do everything again now for iOS. Um, so I would really recommend to plan ahead um, in this uh, in this regard, which framework or which, which things can be reused that are already out there um, if you plan to go with a project like this. Um, we could not do this because uh, there was nothing that, that offered all these functions. Um, but um, it's something if you can avoid having to implement everything multiple times, that's it's certainly worth it. Um, although you have to be careful that you could get um, dependent on a certain framework and might become difficult to move away. I mean, that's the downside of this. But um, yeah, thinking ahead of where you're going. I mean, I mentioned also that um, the uh, that I'm not proud and happy about the old code when we were just developing this thing for our own lecture. And it's a little bit hard for a community to participate in this part. Of course, if you are able to plan ahead, then of course a good structure um, of the of the app uh, in the beginning saves a lot of time later and makes it easier for others to join in. So um, um, okay. it's 
a textbook recommendation a little bit. It's something everyone says, uh, talks about, but yeah, um, that's the problem I have to face every day now. And um, so that's something to keep in mind at the beginning. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you very much for this advice. Uh, I probably have to remind uh, the potential uh, participants of the hackathon that within these three days, so Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, which we'll be using on designing this prototype and on thinking uh, of this, how this app could have functionalities, you don't have to deal with these things. Um, once once you uh, you won this hackathon and, and you want to continue to implement your idea and to make really a reality out of this and, and make it fly, then um, the organizers of this hackathon, we will uh, provide you with uh, guidance and, and yeah, professional coaches and, and, and technical assistance. So even if you're not an IT uh, freak and, and you didn't understand everything what Sebastian was, was <laughs> saying right now, uh, it, it, it shouldn't uh, keep you from participating. So I think, yeah, these design tests are very important, but I think, yeah, it's so the first step we don't have to, our students don't have to um, deal with them, I, I, I would say. So this is just, a, but thank you very much for, for, for the second uh, step advice. So I guess this is very important. All right, then I, I think, thank you very much um, for, uh, to all of you for, for this fantastic um, discussion. I think, yeah, we had a very uh, rich discussion from, from the beginning on what, what, what children need to be excited um, in school, um, what, what makes them decide for, for a STEM career. Then uh, we heard about the, the uh, Kinderforscher and the Nachwuchs Campus from Gesine Lise. So they really go into schools and try to excite people and try to make them curious and, and, and challenged. And then we heard about um, yeah, the gender balance and, and um, wh why, why girls are not as, uh, yeah, try to find answers to the question, why, why are girls not as attracted to STEM studies right now as they could, as, as boys are? And um, yeah, Yulia um, told us about her initiative of, of the hacker school and, and, and the girls hacker school are trying to bring IT to, to all uh, students. And now they're targeting also uh, yeah, schools and, and, um, yeah, and, and have a, an extensive online um, offer. And then Andrea told us what's, what's happening at university and what the cutting edge modern didactics tend to. So we have heard about challenge-based um, uh, learning. So challenges kind of what makes my pizza dough grow and or how can we make our campus um, carbon neutral? And, and that helps people or students be motivated for what they do. And, and potentially that also helps, um, yeah, keep, yeah, keeping them uh, bound to the, the studies they do. So we don't want them to, to quit because they don't see sense in what they're doing. I think those uh, fraction that you were mentioning there, I was especially, so we shouldn't lose good people because they think it doesn't make any sense what they're saying. Well, these are the worst people to lose. Um, I guess this is really something we, we should address. And then, um, yeah, we heard about this fantastic tool uh, that Sebastian Stacks and, and his colleagues at RWTH Aachen uh, are implementing or were implementing this that's yeah already being heavily used at schools and and I'm using it myself and I hope uh, some of you will install it uh, as well and yeah and we also uh, learned that there might be some good overlap between uh, members of, of this panel now uh, that um, yeah hopefully some new projects arise from this and and with this, I would like to thank um, the panelists once again. I think we, we can conclude this first um, session or so the, the, the closed um, round and open up for questions from, from the audience. And, and uh, yeah, I'm really excited to hear if there are questions and, uh, for our panelists here. I yeah, we don't have started. questions yet. Maybe the, the audience is feeling now a little bit lazy today. But uh, please, if you have any question to the to the speakers, uh, let's do it now. Or Ale Alexander, I don't know if you have any topic more to to uh, open a, a discussion. We have like 15 minutes more to talk. Or any of the speakers wants to uh, tell us anything more? I'm I'm sure there will be some questions if we now uh, ask the audience to come up with questions. No, I think I would have a lot of questions, but I. 
I would really uh, love to give the audience also a chance to to uh, follow up on on some points that were maybe we can. Um, but while while pre people uh, start typing, it, it it also takes some time. Maybe I can remind people of of the hackathon and of the of the goals and and the criteria. And uh, so the hackathon will take place Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. It's a digital hackathon, and the goal of this is to form teams of at least six people. And you can also join uh, as a single person. You will be assigned to a team. So don't worry if you if you're not in six teams uh, in in six people already. Um, and it's aimed at creating a digital tool that motivates uh, young students in STEM education. And kind of what we yeah talked about um, this hour and the criteria of uh, the evaluation so this attractive price of uh, 5000 euros in total for the first three uh, winning teams and and the criteria are resolution of the challenge so the, the quality um, uh, the usability of your idea and the, the creativity and the design of of uh, the proposed um, a tool Teamwork, also how well you worked as a team, and um, innovation and originality. So this is really what you should be focusing on, and yeah, and you should be excited about what you're doing. And then, then I'm, I'm sure this this criteria will will uh, be fulfilled. But I, that's what you should be aiming at. And and you can still um, sign up for the uh, hackathon, right, Diego? It's it's still open. Yes, yeah, still open, and uh, you did it so well that now we have one question. So yeah, your summarize your summary were was perfect to to make some time for the people. Did you see it? Uh, more than a question. I want to thank for the space, so many topics and ideas to share in my school. Oh, great! Uh, that's uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Maria Gabriello, Gabriela Brito. I cannot see the whole name. Um, yeah, thank you very much for, for this nice um, a comment. Yeah. Arroyo, now I saw it. Um, yeah. And we have one from Andreas Liese, which ah. I think that's, that's for, for Sebastian. It's, what is your experience with Firefox using in a class situation where there are totally different versions of smartphones that are available? I don't know if you have <laughs> any... Uh, <laughs> Any yeah, uh, suggestion? I have to say um, this question would better be addressed to a teacher who actually tried it because um, I mostly developed this. Um, uh, so, so I mostly developed the app and uh, do not uh, apply it myself with the students. Uh, but of course, I get feedback from the teachers. Um, it really depends on the sensor and the stuff that you you want to do with the with the app. Um, one th aspect that we um, look after is that we try to make sure that the app is similar uh, as similar as possible on both uh, big platforms, so Android and iOS. As I mentioned, we have to develop both um, uh, independently, um, but we still try to make sure to while staying in the design language of each uh, platform um, to to uh, keep it similar and to um yeah um ah well, what's a good word for this to um to give an interface that then translates into the same in, uh, to the same experience and to the same uh, way the sensors behave on each platform um, but indeed, depending on the sensor, you have uh, quite a few differences. Um, I was quite surprised to to uh, to hear, uh, hear earlier that uh, light sensors gave such a consistent um, reading because that's actually one of the sensors where we are sometimes a bit worried about because we're very dependent on how well the manufacturer calibrates the sensor. Um, which I did, would not expect them all to do that thoroughly because um, actually the sensor already gives to us the um, illumina illuminance in lux, so the physical unit for, for uh, the how strong light shines onto a given surface. Um, but for almost every um, application of the light sensor, it's only about dimming the display. So they do not really have to care that much about a good calibration. Um, on the other hand, an accelerometer is available on every single smartphone. It's used in pretty much every game to, to steer uh, cars by turning the phone um, and stuff like that. So you can expect quite consistent and good results from this sensor. And um, what we advise to, to teachers is, um, 
uh, is to um, ask the students which sensor is available, um, because especially the barometer is one that tends to be only available in the more expensive phones, and you have to be careful not to put uh, students at a disadvantage who cannot um, afford or do not want to afford an expensive phone. So you can check if enough students have that sensor available that you can form groups that they can work together, for example, while on other um, sensors you will learn from from asking the students that they say, okay, um, we all have the accelerometer, no problem, and the microphone always is no problem at all. Um, and usually once the sensor is available, most experiments work the same on all phones. There are some minor differences in the actual data rate of the sensors, but unless you're doing some very specific experiments where this plays a role, um, in most cases, it's not that much of a problem anymore. That was quite a long answer, is it, for a short question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe what what was your experience, Olaf? Did you uh, have any trouble with the students using the different uh, devices? No, we, we did just uh, what Sebastian said. We we formed groups, um, so we we counted how many uh, smartphones have this sensor, and then we formed groups. So every group had at least one smartphone, which was able to um, to measure the light uh, intensity. And by this, uh, all students were able to to participate in the project. Yeah, and we found that uh, we found just that that, uh, that the iPhone is not able to um, yeah to measure the light intensity, but we had enough enough uh, Androids, and so this wasn't any problem. Uh, there's one thing which is quite interesting. Um, I think I have to go back to the late 1990s. There was a computer scientist at the University of Maryland. Um, ben Schneiderman, and I think he was one of the first persons who thought about um, how does um, how does a working process in teaching or in learning processes uh, how how is there any typical row or steps of learning? And he described uh, four steps. And the first step is collecting data, gathering information. Um, the second step is um, is relating these things. So you get into a cognition process and start to, um, to think about what is more relevant information, what is less relevant. And um, you, you start to, to, to sort your data, uh, looking for pattern orders, um, correlations, this kind of thing. So he called it re relating. And the third step um, he called creating or to create something. So if you did all this, then you start to figure out certain ideas. And you, you uh, perhaps a small hypothesis, um, and you try to, to um, elaborate results. Um, that's this creative um, thing you do. And after that, um, the, the, the last phase or the last step is the step of dissemination. Um, to, to share the ideas, to share the results, um, to, to create a presentation, a poster talk, uh, whatever. And um, I love this four steps because it's so easy and it's a very good did didactical um, board to, to, um, to plan my lessons in this kind of sequences. And if somebody develops an app, an application, he, he should think about um, where in this row, where does the app catalyzes the learning process? All these apps are catalyzers. And um, that's quite interesting. Like Firefox is very good for hunting for data. And it's exciting to, to hunt for data. So that's what, what the, the students love to do, just gathering all this information. So you need interfaces to, to data that are public, for instance, in your app. And, but Firefox makes more. Firefox, I can export um, diagrams. I can um, I can um, create patterns within these data. So I'm also in the step two, relating the data. And I'm also with Firefox. I'm also in the step three, creating some results. So and I'm also with Firefox. I'm also in step four um, by disseminating um, my results uh, and sharing the data in groups, for instance. So um, I think it's quite important to think where does an app catalyzes within the, um, the learning process. 
And I think um, within the Hackathon project, uh, if there's somebody designing an app, he should really, he should carefully prove um, what does the app, um, yes, where, where does the app uh, unfold its power? Yes. Yeah, that's a great advice. Uh, thank you, Olaf. And talking, talking about the data, uh, someone, an anonymous uh, um, uh, spectator is asking, I hope he's not a, a hacker, but he is asking or she is asking that if it's possible to extract data from fi uh, Firefox, like an API or something like this. Yeah, I have to say I'm really happy about these questions, almost as if I hired someone, because that's something I really like, love to show. Uh, I've already seen it. I'll try if I can show something. No, don't worry, I'm not planning on giving an actual talk, but no, that's the wrong screen. Hi, that's an infinite uh, something. Sorry, <laughs> I didn't test this before, but then I think it should be, nope, also another screen. Another screen. Okay, then it's the last screen I try. Um, what's the order of these screens? Right. Okay. So this screen it is. Um, so this is just to, so I have to, it's a few images to show. Um, it's uh, actually part of a talk I gave at the Chaos Communication Congress. So if you're interested, you might want to search for this. But in detail, um, that's, but, but, but a quick overview. Um, one of the basic things on FeeFox is that we have this um, file format at, at the back of FeeFox. So you can so forget the left part of the screen probably, but the right one you see is an extract from our um, documentation of the file format. Uh, you can find it at feefox.org slash wiki, or just go to feefox.org where you find the wiki somewhere in the menu. Um, and with this file format, you can create your own um, experiments or your own configurations for feefox. So let's make this full screen or I see ah, that's too spontaneous what I'm doing here, I see, because it's cut off. Let me correct this. Uh, that's fine, we're spontaneous. Uh, there's no other questions, I think, so take your time. So. Okay, no. yeah, but but I think the point is not that I'm giving a talk here, right? But uh, so the idea is that um, you create uh, this configuration, which is an XML format, and then in FeeFox, now I open the live view from my phone again, you can go to this plus and scan this QR code. And in this example, that's not yet for data collection, but this example is a very nerdy example because it's a very nerdy event for which I did this, um, where we have a Turing machine running in FeeFox counting upwards binary. Uh, so if you don't understand what this is, it doesn't really matter. It's a very geeky way to demonstrate that with this file format, you can do pretty much everything. And the idea is you can, um, oh, sorry, I already switched my phone back to German, but I hope you can still follow. You can say that you want to add it to the main menu and if you scroll down, I don't know what the category was. Here, there you find this Turing machine thing that I just got from the QR code. And this way you can add configurations to this main menu. And with these, you can do a bunch of, so there are actually, I would say three ways to collect data from the phone. Um, the first one would be um, via network. Uh, actually, this is an example I want to add later, which might be a good starting point, but um, you can have a QR code that uh, sends the data from, from the phone from everyone who scans the QR code to a server, uh, like this example where we did an experiment with the entire, oh sorry, I still got the phone in front of the uh, of the screen, we we've, we've did an experiment with the, the entire uh, lecture hall, so every student there uh, had their phone on a spring that we uh, distributed earlier and we were collecting the data on the main screen um, to determine the spring constant. Um, another example is this one where we did an international experiment where our users were asked, where we asked our users to orient the phone to the sun throughout the day. Uh, and because of the orientation of the phone and the GPS location, we could then determine the position of the sun. And since we did this during the winter solstice, so the shortest day of the year, um, the position of the sun matches uh, the actual tilt of Earth. So with a bunch of contributions across the, the globe, we could, de could determine the orientation of, the, of, of Earth, um, which we did through this, um, yeah, with a specific XML file, a QR code that we shared with the users. And within this XML file, we could de uh, define um, how to transmit data um, to a server. Um, so just so you know where to find info about this. So this can be found in our wiki down here on network connections. But for this example, so that's 
a rather demanding way to, to uh, send the data, you should then start with the VFOX file format to understand how these XML files work. Another option would be Bluetooth. Um, so yeah, this is a commercial device that we read out. This is a demonstrator for solid state physics stuff. That's actually graphene, hot sensor in there. But the easiest way to start with the Bluetooth interface is our Arduino library, which uh, only requires, so it's actually in the official, um, is it in, ah, no, it's not in these older slides, the official uh, Arduino um, library repository. So if you have got the Arduino IDE open, you're using a microcontroller and you want to get data from FIFOX onto the microcontroller, um, have a look at the libraries uh, in, in the Arduino IDE, search for FIFOX. And if you install it, there are examples on how to do this or simply visit fifox.org slash Arduino to find the link to our JIT repository um, and then have a look at the examples to find a version where you can get data from the smartphone onto your Arduino if this is the direction you want to go. And the third option, which does not involve the XML stuff, but uh, so which I skipped over here at the beginning, which is a, the quickest way to, to just um, play with the data um, would be a REST API that we have. Um, for this one, so, <laughs> so it's very technical, of course, but you're asking how to get the data from the phone with via an API. So I think um, uh, most of this will probably um, um, give you some ideas. Um, for those of you who have worked with VFOX before, you might have found this function that's called um, remote access. So yeah, quickly switch it back to English so uh, everyone can follow. Um, okay, so back in here, I think I have to, yeah. So um, there's this function, allow remote access. And if you enable this, um, you get an address at the bottom of uh, of the VFOX screen, which is just cut off again with the way I present it. So if I move it up here. So with this address, uh, you can enter this into your web browser. Um, let me summon a web browser. I think it's opening somewhere, but I'm not sure. Okay, so I just take another window from here. Okay, and you just enter this address up here. So 192.168.2148. So this, of course, this is my local IP address, my local network. Then you get this type of interface where you can remote control VFOX. So I can start it here and the measurement starts on both. But this also acts as a REST API. So if you instead, I hope I get it right on the first try, um, extend this address by saying, oh, there's already an example in my history like this, you can get the actual data. So if I... Um, start the measurement again a little bit and collect a little bit more data and refresh this, you see there are more numbers in there. So this is a, actually a fully documented REST API that you can use. And from pretty much every programming language over the network interface, if you enable this remote access function, you can get the data. And in this example here, actually this is from uh, the end of 2017. So uh, we have this function there for quite a while now. Um, I use this, uh, use a Python script to read out this interface and control a software synthesizer by uh, tilting my phone. Um, and you can also find this in our wiki. Um, so where is it? Um, REST API, so remote interface communication. Here we document how these requests work with VFOX. And somewhere in there, there should also be a link to this YouTube video in which I demonstrated this. Um, and a little bit hidden, but below this, there's also the actual Python script, which is not a perfect example, but um, where you can get an idea on how to interface with the REST API for VFOX. So I would say there are about three options. Bluetooth, if this is the direction you want to go because you're using an Arduino or something like this, um, you could use, uh, so let's get my face back, yeah. Uh, you could use the um, uh, network interface, which is, I would say, the really professional way to collect data from your users, uh, if, if there are multiple users who should collect data. Um, or you could, could use the REST API for quickly accessing it from pretty much every programming language. I hope this answers the question, and I hope it wasn't too extensive for <laughs> everyone who's still around.
Great. Thank you, yeah, thank you, very, thank much. you very much, Sebastian, <laughs> for, the, for the demonstration. So if this was improvised, it was very well improvised, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> I did not pay anyone for to ask this question, so, but it's part of um, whenever I present VFOX to a more geeky audience um, or to uh, advanced audience, I have these slides in there. So um, right. Thank it's you. not the first time I explained this. <laughs> yeah, and I think, uh, yeah, our audience also thanks you for this. Um, thanks a lot. We'll surely try all. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. So probably a very advanced person. Also, yeah. might be worth looking at our forums or simply contacting us if something doesn't work. Um, okay. This. Thank you. Well, I think uh, now we're at the end of yeah. of today of today's discussion. I would like to thank all the panelists again for your for your presence here for your wonderful contributions to this discussion. I'm I'm really yeah excited how this all turned out to be a very round um, and, and, and sound um, yeah, discussion. I really enjoyed it. I hope uh, you enjoyed it as well. Yeah, um, a big applause for you, for all of you also, Alexander, for you, for your work. Thank you very much. Yeah, and I would like to thank uh, the audience for being with us and for, for listening to, to all of our wonderful speakers. And yeah, and for the nice questions. And yeah, I would once again um, recommend that you participate to this hackathon and, and yeah, try to, to change the way uh, STEM education is, is done. And, and, and there's definitely uh, things to improve as we learned today. And, and, and there's many people excited about it and, and let's get more people excited about it. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was fantastic. Oh, standing. Yeah. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you. And yeah, hope to see you soon in some or other way. Of course. Bye bye. -bye.